So I, I want to come back to this idea of a cultural of culture Zionism. I think that's really interesting. But first, I, I, I want to just touch touch on this experience that you had visiting the West Bank mm-hmm. and ask you about a comparison that many people have made between apartheid South Africa and conditions that Palestinians are living under uh, in occupied territories. Uh, there are some who say that's an inappropriate comparison to make. But given that you're someone who has South African family members and who has experienced both, I, I, I want you to dig into that comparison and explain to me what you saw upon visiting the West Bank that makes it, in your eyes, an apt one. Right. So I think the first thing to understand is that although apartheid is an Afrikaans word, which essentially means apartness, um, it also developed an international legal definition, which transcends just South Africa. So a situation doesn't have to look exactly the same. We kind of know this intuitively, right? Because we might refer to American apartheid, right? And we're not saying, yes. saying it's exactly the same, but we're recognizing that it means something broader. And international law basically means a kind of legalized domination by one group, racial, religious, ethnic, over another. Um, and so in those terms, it, it's not surprising that Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, and indeed Israel's own leading human rights organizations, the Salem and Yeshdin, have declared that Israel is a practicing apartheid, because certainly in the West Bank, we can talk about how it expresses itself differently in, in Gaza or, or in inside Israel proper, but in the West Bank, literally, you have two groups of people living under different legal systems. Is, Israeli, Jewish settlers are Israeli citizens. They have all the benefits of citizenship. They can vote. They have due process. They live in civil law. They have free movement. Palestinians can't become citizens of the country in which they live. They can't vote for the Israeli government that controls their lives. They can't, they, they live under military law where they can, they have a 99 plus prosecution rate. So these two groups mm-hmm. of people living side by side are clearly being treated in radically different ways by the law. I mean, one has legal supremacy and one has legal inferiority. Um, and interestingly, if you look at, you know, there's really a very strong consensus among uh, the leaders of the ANC, you know, in terms of Black South Africans who overthrew apartheid. That, that that's this actually does qualify from apartheid from from Desmond Tutu to the current president Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa. It's really not a controversial proposition in South Africa among people who actually experienced it there. Yeah. All right. So talk to me about um, cultural Zionism because let, let me tell you why I'm interested. I yeah. do. Uh, I have been having some um, some deep conversations with Jewish friends who, I think, as you described yourself, saw themselves continue to see themselves as progressive Jews who have always condemned and been very critical of the treatment of Palestinians, but who up until recently, or they're still negotiating this within themselves, um, saw a real value in there being not just a state of Israel, but a an explicitly Jewish state of Israel, even given what that means for the disparate treatment of non-Jews within the state of Israel. And I wonder, you know, there there still seems to be, I think, this kind of psychic attachment to the idea, perhaps what you've described your grandmother feeling that I frankly resonate with as a Black American yeah. who yeah. similarly looks around sometimes and goes, God damn, it would be nice for <laughs> there to be a place to go in the abstract. But of course, that abuts attention. The, 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 the tension is is it that that abuts uh, a kind of... Um, uh, lack of an acknowledgement of what that means for whoever currently might live in this abstraction of a place uh, or what it means to have a necessarily exclusionary policy to maintain the demographic numbers that would be required to maintain such an exclusively Black American homeland. So what does it mean to you uh, to be kind of culturally Zionist? Right, right. So, so, so cultural Zionism is a very distinct and very, was very much a minority tradition political Zionism, which we associate with the figure of Theodor Herzl originally, was the idea that there should be a Jewish state, a, a state which which is basically gives you some kind of supremacy over Palestinians and other people. I don't support that. Um, there was a there was another tradition which started with a thinker named Ahad Ha'am, which did not actually support a Jewish state. I don't support a Jewish state, but supported what you might call a Jewish society, a Jewish culture, which is to say it was very important for these people in the mid-1940s Figures like Martin Buber, the philosopher, Judah Magnus, the founder of Hebrew University, actually argued against a Jewish state. But it was important for them that there be a Jewish presence in Israel-Palestine, to create, to revive Hebrew as a living language. 
to do a kind of cultural production that was possible in that place and wasn't possible in other places. So for what I support is a an equal binational state in which Jews and Palestinians are treated equally throughout the territory between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. But the reason I call myself a cultural Zionist, even though it's funny, most a lot of people inside the Jewish community don't believe me when I say I'm a cultural Zionist. They say, no, you're just an anti-Zionist. But the reason that I find value in the term cultural Zionism, even though it's radically different from the Zionism that we see today, is it's for me a way of saying that my vision of equality is one in which I believe in Jewish flourishing in Israel-Palestine, a Jewish culture, even a Jewish society, but within conditions of legal equality with Palestine. I, I'm curious, though, I mean, practically speaking, what does that mean? Because part of the way, obviously, I mean, the way that we ended up getting to a mass migration of Jewish people into the region had to do with a post-colonial land grant from the from England um, and a right, a legal right that was offered to Jewish people in the diaspora to move to a place at the same time that there was a militarized, forceful exclusion of populations that were already ex existing in the area out of that area. And the battle since then has largely been about maintaining those kind of geographic um, uh, ratios. A world where everyone can, you know, where you would hope for, let's say, uh, a congregation of Jewish people to come and have a kind of a cultural revival linguistically and otherwise. How does that happen without an immigration paradigm that privileges the right of return for Jewish people, but doesn't privilege a right of return for not just Arabs, Muslims, people who previously lived in what is now described as Israel, but basically a, an open borders policy where anybody can move there, thus kind of undermining the goal of a predominantly or, you know, meaningfully Jewish community as opposed to a truly just global community. So look, the immigration has already happened, right? Um, there, there has been, a, there was a mass immigration of Jews to uh, Palestine and then what became Israel. Um, and so for me, part of calling myself a cultural Zionist is, is, is saying that I believe that, that that Jewish community should and can prosper and thrive under conditions of legal equality in a state that does not privilege Jews over Palestinians, but a state that would be a binational state, which would recognize that it had two peoples um, within it, both of whom deserved a certain form of cultural autonomy. Most Israeli Jews will want to still educate their kids in Hebrew. Most Palestinians will want to educate their kids in Arabic. I think that Jews should be learning Arabic as well as a second language, and Palestinians should be learning Hebrew as a second language. In terms of immigration policy, what I would want in my preferred state would be would be no privilege for Jews over Palestinians. First of all, I believe in the right of Palestinian refugee return. I believe that Palestinians who were expelled and their children and grandchildren, et cetera, have the right, if they want, to be able to return to those places. I know how precious th those places are to them. And, and I believe that there's a right under international law. I also believe that a an equal binational state could say that it would take a particular, have a particular concern for any Palestinian around the world or any Jew around the world who was in distress. So, for instance, I think that, that if there was a Jewish person who was threatened by anti-Semitism somewhere around the world, I think that person should be able to go, or a Palestinian person who was threatened, I think they should go to the front of the line to be able to be allowed to become citizens of that country. Beyond that, I think such a country should have a liberal, open immigration policy of the kind that I would want a country like the United States to have. Okay. I mean, it is, it's interesting to have this kind of conversation because the conversation that's happening outside of the context of this, conver uh, of this podcast is so different, right? We had Joe Biden a few nights ago at a, um, a White House uh, Hanukkah celebration talking about how no Jewish person is safe anywhere in the world. As I said after the attack, my commitment to the safety of the Jewish people and the security of Israel and its right to exist is independent, Jew as an independent Jewish state is un un just unshakable. Folks, were there no Israel, there wouldn't be a Jew in the world that was safe. More than always. And remarks that caused a lot of people to bristle in part because here he is 
as president of a country with the second largest Jewish population in the world, very close second to Israel, basically proclaiming that he doesn't believe he can keep Jewish people safe in the United States of America. And so I, I, I wonder what you make of it when you look at these other arguments that say the, necess- the necessity of Israel has to do with the vulnerability, the very the real physical vulnerability of Jewish people elsewhere, and that that very vulnerability is why there cannot be the kind of open border policy or there cannot be a right of return for Palestinians and why it cannot be that the demographics of the uh, region aren't controlled uh, to maintain Jewish majorities because otherwise that safety that is guaranteed by a Jewish majority might be imperiled. Right, right. Exactly. You know, my view is a minority view. Most most American Jews, most Jews around the world, even many, many, many people who are my close friends and family disagree with me. They basically believe it is a non it's non negotiable that there needs to be a country in which Jews are in control. This term majority is actually a little bit slippery because it's not really about having a numerical majority. The truth is, a majority of the people between the river and the sea today are Palestinian. It's just that most of them can't vote. Right. So mm-hmm. it's not so much, it's about basically whether you have political dominance. And I think although people like to talk about it in terms of a, a demographic majority, because it's a little bit, it's kind of, it's euphemistic. What it really means is we need to maintain political dominance. Either they're not here in large numbers, or if they're here, they can't have a voice in government. And that's what will keep Jews safe. I disagree. The, the reason I disagree is, is really pretty simple. It's that when you hold people without basic rights, you are inflicting a tremendous amount of violence on them. And we tend to, we may notice that now in Gaza because the violence is so spectacular, but the violence is ongoing everywhere for Palestine, the Palestinians lack basic rights in a really, really profound way. And I believe that when you inflict this violence on people, the structural of violence on oppression, it ultimately makes you unsafe too, because you are when people have the right to participate in government to make government listen to them nonviolently i think that creates a situation which is much more peaceful for everybody and again i'm influenced by the fact that i spent a lot of time in apartheid south africa as a kid and white south africans were completely convinced that that in Conte was his way, the military wing of the ANC, you know, Nelson Mandela did not believe in nonviolence. You know, he believed in armed resistance. And most white South Africans believe that if there was not a white state protecting them, that these forces of black South African armed resistance would just wipe them out, as did many, for instance, Protestants in Northern Ireland. They saw that the Irish Republican Army was launching violent attacks including terrorist attacks in London, and they thought it's only our supremacy that it's protecting us. But in fact, once Black South Africans got the vote, once Catholics got equality in Northern Ireland, the IRA ceased to exist. In quantum with this way, ceased to exist because people had a, a way of getting the government to respond to them without having to turn to armed resistance. And so I really believe that actually that although a, an equal binational state would be messy and difficult in lots of ways, that it will be in the long term safer for Israeli Jews, because when Palestinians are not suffering the violence of oppression, they will be less likely to use violence against Israeli Jews. Yeah. Well, Professor Bynard, I, I want to get into the meat and potatoes of why I've asked you here, which is your your recent piece in Jewish Currents called Harvard is Ignoring Its Own Anti-Semitism Experts. And in this piece, you take on I think a unique aspect of the ongoing national controversy around the heads of Harvard, uh, no, the no longer head of um, University of Pennsylvania and MIT, who were last week brought before uh, the House to be questioned on their campus anti-Semitism policies. You frame this by asking the question, why is it that now that Harvard has put together a board to review campus policies, that none of Harvard's experts on the question of or the history of anti-Semitism and Zionism have been asked to participate. How do you answer that? Well, the the reason is that this committee at, at Harvard has created one, Penn has created one, uh, NYU has created one, to basically formulate an action plan against anti-Semitism are being driven in large measure by donors 
who have views about anti-Semitism that are quite similar to establishment Jewish organizations like the Anti-Defamation League, which is to say they believe that a lot of pro-Palestinian activism, which is anti-Zionist, is anti-Semitic. And what they want to do is get these universities to suppress this speech in some way or another, not allow people to say phrases like, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, or intifada, or, 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 or not have a Students for Justice in Palestine chapter. In fact, there have been several universities now where they've been suspended or banned. <laughs> but there's a funny problem they have, which is that the people who, oh, in general, I mean, there are exceptions, but for the most part, the people who study anti-Semitism, especially as it relates to Israel-Palestine, in the Jewish studies faculties, don't hold that view. Be, they generally believe that, in fact, it's not necessarily anti-Semitic to have an anti-Zionist view. The political discourse and perspective in Jewish studies departments is very different than it is in the establishment of Jewish organizations. So when these universities basically have to take unqualified people to put them on these anti-Semitism commissions in order to make the donors happy because their own mostly Jewish scholars who study this, won't give them the answers they want, won't tell them it's a good idea to suppress Palestinian speech. Yeah, so the irony that kind of comes across in this piece is that as much as someone like Claudine Gay is getting run over the coals in the public for some tone-deaf answers at that hearing. Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. What's the context? Targeted as an individual. Targeted as, at an individual. It's targeted at Jewish students, Jewish individuals. Do you understand your testimony is dehumanizing them? Do you understand that dehumanization is part of anti-Semitism? I will ask you one more time. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? Anti-Semitic rhetoric when it and crosses is it anti-Semitic con- rhetoric? Anti-Semitic rhetoric when it crosses into conduct that amounts to bullying, harassment, intimidation, that is actionable conduct, and we do take action. So the answer is yes, that calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard Code of Conduct, correct? Again. It depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. These are unacceptable answers across the board. But also for being perceived to be um, overly deferential to uh, left-wing Palestinian, quote-unquote, pro-Hamas groups on campus, it does seem from the behavior here, the composition of the um, task force that's supposed to be addressing this internally, that the main priority seems to be addressing donor concerns, which are very much coming from the um, pro-Israel, pro-Zionist perspective, as opposed to showing a lot of difference for these student groups. Yes, although to be fair, there are also Jewish students who feel threatened by this pro-Palestinian activism. There are. I mean, the truth is the Jewish students have a range of different perspectives because, and this is one of the things that I think the Jewish American Jewish establishment doesn't want to acknowledge, especially among younger American Jews, there is a profound difference of opinion on this question, right? The, the, you know, people like to kind of imagine, there's almost a kind of an intellectual civil war happening, especially among younger American Jews. Because among younger American Jews, views, fundamental questioning of Israel and even of Zionism is not that margin, right? So you have, on the one hand, some Jewish students who you are more Zionist, who feel like the pro-Palestinian activism is very threatening and, 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 and to them, and, and they see it as anti-Semitic. On the other hand, in these pro-Palestinian groups and on these activists in these, in these protests, you also have a lot of Jewish students. One of the groups that was suspended at Columbia, along with students, students from Justin Palestine, was a Jewish organization, an anti-Zionist Jewish organization, Jewish, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace. And, and so I think that's what's happening. I, I think what Claudine, you know, these college presidents, the fundamental problem that I think they had at that hearing is they weren't willing to engage in a substantive conversation about the issue of Israel-Palestine because they didn't want to get into any substantive questions about that. They accepted these ridiculous premises that Elise Stefanik was laying out, right? So Elise Stefanik says, chanting the word intifada means you're calling for genocide of Jews. That's just total nonsense. 
right? Intifada is basically means uprising in Arabic. There have been intifadas against Arab governments. Yeah. It's like saying if the Ukrainians are having an uprising against Russia, and even if they're using violence, and even if they're using violence against Russian civilians, which I oppose, as I fundamentally oppose Palestinian use of violence against Israeli Jews, it doesn't mean they're trying to kill all the Jews in the world. It means they're fighting, perhaps in a misguided, perhaps even in an immoral way, against oppression. But because because Tony Gay and the others didn't want to say any of that, they accept the premise, right, which is that there are these massive calls for genocide on, of Jews on college campuses. They're not. They don't exist. Right. And and then they get screwed because they basically are not willing to say we are oppo- we, we, we want to we, we oppose these. They're not happening at all. But, but that's the part of it that I think hadn't really occurred to me till I read your article. I mean, it was frankly dumbfounding to see the trapping laid and for these very right. smart, accomplished people to not do a better job of, of avoiding it. But in fact, seeming to walk head into the open mouth of the lion. But when you frame it, when, when you add this added complexity of them already being under pressure not to also alternatively make a full-throated argument against the characterization of those phrases, when you when you when you provide the added context of them being under pressure also from donor groups, um, alumni, whomever it is, to also not validate that something like from the river to the sea is legitimate speech and being able to talk about that comprehensively, you can see how they could end up retreating into the technical argument about whether or not the student code of conduct is or is not violated by a given piece of speech. Because if you engage, right, then you have to start making arguments like all of these uh, Jewish professors who were not invited to the task force have historically made, which is that no, anti-Zionism is not necessarily anti-Semitism. And no, from the river to the sea is not necessarily an anti-Semitic statement. And so yeah. I don't know, that that makes me simultaneously understand them better, but frankly also have a degree less of sympathy for them falling for the trap. Right. And I think part of the problem is also that, you know, we, Edward Said famously wrote this essay in 1982, where he said Palestinians lack permission to narrate, which is they're not able mm-hmm. to basically tell their own story. And this, and, and this is part of the climate in which people like Floyd Gay are operating, right? Which is that we're, people are constantly telling Palestinians what this term intifada means, what this term Palestine from the river to sea to mean. And there's very little space. I mean, imagine if you had had on that congressional testimony, a Palestinian scholar of Palestinian history, like Rashid Khalidi at Columbia, and someone had turned to him and said, Professor Khalidi, based on your academic history, what do these terms mean? Then it, the conversation is completely different, right? But instead, the, the, the assumption is basically that, that, that Palestinians are motivated by uh, a pathological hatred of Jews Per se, a Jew, Jews qua Jews, right? Um, and so, and 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 even when you have people like Rashida Tlaib, right, who have said again and again and again that their vision is quite similar to my vision. Actually, they want Jews and Palestinians to live alongside each other, equally in safety. She still gets censured for using the term Palestine for the river of the sea. Meanwhile, we have a state that controls all the territory between the river and the sea, and we don't have to ima- ask theoretically what that would mean for Palestinians, like we're asking theoretically what a Palestine from the river to sea would mean for Jews. We know what Israel means for Palestinians. It means apartheid according to its own human rights organization. But that doesn't get you censured. I mean, the whole thing is so, to me, kind of surreal. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.